And I'm going to ask everyone to stay muted unless you're speaking. Thank you. Um, if you could do us a favor and give us a roll call, please. Yeah. Aaron Myers, Mary Helen Kincaid. Here. Kathy Kellen. Here. Bell Humble. Right here. Eric Molander. Here. Um, and we Board have quorum. There's a okay, first up is going to be Lori Baker with a financial presentation. Yes, let me share my screen. Can you all see that? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. So today we're going to walk through our financial statements through March of 2023, which is reflective of nine months of activity in the current fiscal year. This is a summary of Pen 2s financial results through March. This column shows the budget for the full year. And this column shows the actual results, both revenue and expenditures for the first seven months or first nine months of the fiscal year, excuse me. Assessment revenues are ahead of budget by $47,000 and we will continue to receive payments each month through the end of the fiscal year. Compression was lower than anticipated in the budget for the current year, which is why we're running above budget, which is good news. Other revenue is behind budget by $382,000 because of the timing of grant revenues for the PMLS project local match. We'll be talking about this topic a few times today, including when we look at the budget. Um, this is a reimbursement grant. So it'll, the revenue will be recorded when we receive the funding request from the Corps of Engineers. And we're anticipating at this point that the first two years of PMLS funding will occur in fiscal year 23-24. So we're going to show a shift of those dollars in the budget as well. On the expenditure side, system maintenance is the maintenance fixed fee from MCDD and other maintenance projects not included in the fixed fee. The positive variance at this point is due to the timing of some ditch maintenance projects. Projects and planning, which are non-capital projects are under budget by $126,000. The most significant line item variances include development review, which is under budget by 7,000. Houseless coordination is under budget by 20,000. Easement gap analysis is under budget by 40,000. And the Bridgeton Slope Regrading Project is under budget by um, 61,000. Professional services are under budget by $118,000, which is mainly due to positive variances in legal expense of $80,000 and community relations of $28,000. The administrative fixed fee reflects nine months worth of activity and is online to match budget by year end. And capital outlay is running behind budget due primarily to the timing of the payment of that local match for the PMLS project that we discussed in other revenues and the timing of the 13th Avenue pipe project resulting in a $161,000 positive variance. So we have some timing differences on the capital side. And with that, I can take any questions on the financials. I have a question. Um, sure. When you said, of course I have a question. It wouldn't be a meeting without me. Um, I, would, I would feel sad, Mary Helen, if you didn't have a question. <laughs> well, you know that I was really sick or something. But anyway, um, <laughs> the under budget amounts that you spoke of, um, mm -hmm. Are those printed in? I mean, you spoke of them, but I don't see the detail and I didn't get them written down. Um, I can send you my notes if you'd like. Okay, that would be good. I mean, because my questions are, um, why are they under budget? And um, I, 
I would have questions, but I, I, I couldn't write down what they were and obviously okay. I didn't remember what they were. Well, let me jump back. So the biggie, Mary Helen, is just the timing of the PMLS local match. And that mainly has to do with the timing of all of the agreements that we need to get signed in order to fund that, as well as the timing of the funding request from the um, Army Corps of Engineers. Mary so Helen, it's on that, page two of your packet, if you want to look along. I have page two right here in front of me that you put. Yeah, so the bottom part of that page has uh, exactly the slide that Lori just presented with the arrows pointing to the positive variances. Okay, my page is different than what you're explaining. She mentioned yes. specific things that say under budget. I did, this, and I will send you my notes too, Mary Helen, but I just okay. wanted to kind of review with you. The biggest thing is that PMLS, the shift. So okay. that money, that spending and revenue isn't going to go away. It's just going to move to next year. And then um, on the project and planning side, um, I where thought we're you said about development review and that was development reviews are under budget by 7,000 that, you know, we do our best to estimate what those costs and revenues are going to look like each year, but you know, it's a best guess, right? So if there, if things don't flow through as we anticipate, then you could have some under budget situations on that line item. So that's why that is running behind um the houseless coordination is under by 20,000 just means that we haven't had to do quite as much in that area as what we anticipated when we, when we did the budget which is good news um we've gotten a lot of good response from the city and support with other um, local partners in working in that area and so we're running under budget which is good um I don't have an answer on the easement gap analysis so I one of my um Partners in crime will have to answer that question why we're running behind on that one. And then the bridge chin slope regrading, um, we're also, we're $61,000 under budget on that project. Okay, so the development review, we're under budget because um, we've had to pay more for a development review or we haven't built enough people for development review. Well, there's two sides to that in the accounting. So the revenue side, what we bill people is up in the miscellaneous revenue line and the expense side, which is the people spending time on it is in that project and planning. And um, so since we're under budget by $7,000, it means that we haven't spent as much time on it as what, as what we anticipated. Okay. And, the and the revenue will be running behind too, but net it's probably where it should be. There were fewer development reviews than we anticipated. Is yes. Okay. So yes. there's less cost and less revenue. Okay. Thanks. I just saw Eric. Yeah, hi there. I just saw um, Eric needed to step away to sign a FedEx document. Um, and so he asked me to to step in. Um, and so I, I guess at this point, it's uh, whether there's more conversation, there's more conversation to be had around the budget and the financial review. I think it may be worth highlighting, um, particularly Mary Helen, for you, that I think the legal expenses are underspent because we had loaded the budget in to consider potential dissolution costs that had been um, delayed. So that's uh, a reason for that one as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And I, and I think on the regrading, that project's complete now and we came in under budget. That's correct. Okay. Great. Anything more on the budget or financial presentation? Great. Um, next item, uh, hearing from Amber about vegetation management contract. Thanks, Kathy. Um, hello, Amber Ayers, project manager and planner with the districts. I believe I've met most of you in person, so nice to see you again. Um, I am bringing to you today a on-call services contract. Um, this is to replace our current uh, natural resources contract that we have had. Um, with two firms for the last eight years. Um, 
We needed to put out a new R RFP and follow proper guidelines to um, get some new on-call services. We went through all the procedures and found um, two firms that submitted and were evaluated, and we are recommending that they um, come on board for a five-year on-call. Um, these services include, um, of course, terrestrial vegetation management, so lots of invasive species clearing. The biggest thing for Pen2 um, is the aquatic vegetation. So this is going to be aquatic weeds that greatly um, clog up our, our, our ditches and our system. And actually, Pen2 has seen the, the greatest benefits over these years. So this will be the eighth year that we are going into treatment. Um, and we do have a very skilled firm. Um, I would consider them kind of the experts in the SLU in this manner. And uh, we have asked them to come on board again. And I think we've expanded services to think about potentially uh, future PMLS projects that could be happening um, so that we wouldn't have to be putting out a new RFP. Um, but that's including restoration, mitigation, arborist work that comes up. So we're kind of covering all of our bases for things that might come up in the next uh, current and future years. Amber, would you describe briefly the difference between a contract for a project and an on-call contract? Yeah, um, uh, I think that it allows us a, a lot more um, flexibility to have somebody that we have worked with in the past that we can quickly, quickly get on call to do work. So if a, a tree comes down and is presenting a, a danger or a hazard, um, we don't have to directly go out and, and bid out, say, a new project. We have these on-call contracts to quickly tap into. And they have uh, demonstrated their expertise, experience, their team, everything that came through in their evaluations. Val, I see a hand up. Yes, go ahead. Yes, uh, could you clarify for me my, uh, I had previously thought that all the ditch clearing and stuff was a specialty of the MCDD staff, I remember, uh, a uh, barge you had with a bit with a clearing arm and stuff. I see that has been um, up for replacement recently. But could you clarify for me uh, what do these uh, on call people do that the MCDD staff uh, can't do and shouldn't do? Is it chemical treatment of the water? What what's what's happening there? Very good question, Val. So that is exactly right. So these uh, are the team that comes out specifically. I'll mention a mosaic ecology. Um, as I would say, they they kind of are the aquatic experts in the SLU. They have a team that is trained, certified, constantly up to date, learning new ways. Uh, I mean, they actually had um, their team lead heads our invasive species hotline for the state. Um, they're they're very skilled, and yes, uh, you're right. They our team just doesn't have the time or um, some of the certifications to do that. I think we have one operations member that is looking to get certifications, but he's just not able to do that by himself. I mean, they're going through all of your ditches. Um, I would have to say that Pen2 might be the very first. Um, in the state of Oregon that's actually seeing a Ludwigia, which was predominant in your ditches, um, actually be eradicated. So that is a huge success. Um, there, I'd say overall, I think he cited an 80% 80, 80 reduction in weeds since they've started this. Thank you. Uh, Mary Helen, you had a question? Not a question, just a statement about mosaic ecology. Um, Alex Stant, who is, I don't know his title, but the manager, of some sort of the crews. Um, he started out in the blue heron wetlands and in the Arbavita working with Metro from a Metro grant in 20, I believe 16 um, on his master's thesis. And he's the one who identified with a woman from DEQ, um, the Ludwigia, the, um, the, there's a fancier name for it, but the Ludwigia because it was only the second site in the site that it, state that had ever been um, acknowledged and it was Smith Bybee Lakes and they received all sorts of awards for his work. Um, Portland State was heavily involved. We wrote grants. Um, MCDD shared in a grant from DEQ uh, with the Columbia Children's Arboretum. It was a DEQ mitigation grant and DEQ acted, I mean, sorry, MCDD acted as a fiscal sponsor for the Friends of Blue Heron Wetlands They've planted over, I believe, my number that I've said, but it might be overstated, 2,000 native plants to over that provide shade so the Ludwigia doesn't grow. 
So I, their work has been fantastic. The people that live around Blue Heron Wetlands that visit the um, Columbia Children's Arboretum have all been impressed with how they cleaned up and worked. So um, I think that in that, I, I know nothing about um, the ecosystems, Northwest ecosystems, and what their work has been in, in the area. But um, obviously, the East Columbia has benefited greatly. They um, Metro uses them as well as the city. So I highly recommend being able to use them. And I'm glad that they made a bid. I'd, Alex has been a regular to um, during his um, master's thesis, he would come in the backyard and take naps in our chaise lounge because he'd be like up all night thinking of things and then working. And he knew it was a safe place and he didn't have to drive all the way home. So um, he's a great person to deal with as probably MCDD knows and likes being out in the field more in an office. So I just wanted to add that information that the rest of the board members might not have had. Thanks, Mary Helen. I feel the the same about working with Alex. Um, I think uh, such a delight and such an expert in our field. He actually comes out and teaches the um, operations crew what to be on the lookout for early detection of new species. Um, because I mean, class A listed species in the state of Oregon is actually the property owner's responsibility to remove at all cost. So, um, you know, we have, this is something that I feel the districts are providing a service to keep these ditches and target some weeds, so. Okay. So Amber, a couple of questions for me as well. If you look at our spending for invasive species management, um, 14,021, 20,022, the budget was 24.5, we're expecting it to come in at 22,000 and budgeting next year at 26. This has authorization up to $80,000 for each of those five years. Is, the, is there a ration, what is the rationale behind that? Uh, I, I think I'm understanding your, Eric, Eric, your question. Can you restate it? I'm, I'm not fully understanding what you're Question. If you look at what Pen2 has spent on invasive species management out of our budget, yes, right, it has been growing 14,000 to 20,000 to 22. Yes. But this is authorization for four times that amount. And what is the anticipated additional work that we would be doing? Um, good question. So these on calls are not, you know, just for aquatics. You, you remember that. So um, we have our existing on calls with two firms, and one of them is upwards of one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars that went over the course of eight years. I think we spent about one thirty of that, um, and then the other one was about seventy thousand for that contract. So you're looking at services, not just aquatic. So that's what the scope in this on calls will provide, arborist work. Um, we have invasive species work on the levees that um, actually native ecosystem comes out and does. Uh, we also have, um, think about if in the future, if there is need to do larger restoration, mitigation, these are skilled experts and that's why we bring on these additional consultants to support staff. Okay, and so the, the um if there are additional elements of mitigation that have not been performed in, in the past, that would be part of the justification for this. The yeah. other element is that when we look at the spending vis-a-vis -vis the other uh, districts, um, it seems that th this is a much more significant problem. We have six miles of Sloughs and ditches, and MCDD has 26. Um, what is the rationale? And help me understand your thinking behind allocating so much of this towards Pen 2. Well, currently, right now, MCDD and Pen 2 are the only districts that have a major problem that um, obstructs. Uh, flood risk and conveyance, so that affects our pump stations. So and I might add, Eric, that um, maybe I didn't make this clear, is uh, Penta really benefits right now from the partnership with BES. That aquatic work that you're seeing is actually double that amount, but BES pays half of that currently. 
So right now, every year we are doing surveys and treatments in MCD and PEN2. And BES is actually, because of the effects on water quality and everything else, they're paying half of that. But they also have made it clear that moving forward, thinking about with the new districts, that's not something that they hope to continue, but they're fine doing that for now, for at least another, okay. this another year. So Amber, when we start to add all of that together, how much are we spending in fiscal year 22-23 for the activities that would be covered under this? Um, I would have to double check my budget. So remember the task order for aquatic work in particular is going to be different than this on-call services that will be in place for five years. I believe if, I, if I'm just guessing we're going to be in the same ballpark as survey and treatment, for this next year is this previous year. So you're probably looking at somewhere between, I would say $30,000 is somewhere good for Pen2. Um, I will be uh, this new on call, if we get this in place, I'll able to start my conversations with BES and begin the cost sharing discussions with them. Um, all of that kind of follows suit. Okay. Um, I would like that number, um, and I'd appreciate it if, you know, as, as you start to work with us, that you begin by saying, here's what we've spent in the past, here's the change in responsibilities, this is what we're expecting in the future. Okay, I can do that. Okay. So it looks like you had a task order of almost $18,000 last year for just the aquatic work. As I said, these contracts have broader services than just the aquatic work. We've had um, tree work that comes up, um, that comes to mind. And again, like, like I said, um, vegetation work that sometimes happens on the levee. Right, and so this is gonna be a direct expense to Pen2, correct? It's a direct expense to Pen2 that is budgeted for this next fiscal year, but BES does pay half of that. Okay, and so where does that element of support come in? Is that in other revenue, other resources? This would be through our IGA with BES, and it specifically uh, targets just the aquatic work in Pen2. Okay. So are they paying us to perform the service, I think, or, or is BES taking it on and paying directly through the IGA? I think that Eric's trying to, I, I think Eric identify where in the budget that revenue or that contribution from BES appears. If it doesn't appear in our budget, how, how are they manifesting that support? Is that a fair characterization, Eric? Yes, that's correct. It would be a reimbursement. Um, I would have to look for somebody in finance to give me the details, but yes, we okay. take on the full expense and then we get reimbursed through the IGA. And, and the reality is that when we look at this, this is really just saying you have up to a limit of $400,000 for Pen2 to, to spend. Uh, there is no obligation on our part to do that. And uh, each year we would have to approve a budget for this kind of work, correct? Yes. And then one more, if a task order came in above the delegated authority, we would need to get the board's approval before implementing that task order. Okay. Can you guys still see or hear me? I'm showing myself as a frozen or black screen. We can hear uh, you. You're... Okay. We hear you, but you are a black screen. Okay, well, I'm still here. I suggest you stop your video and restart it. That, help, that helps me when I've done that. Mary Helen, I see you have your hand up. Um, my question is sort of related to Eric and I might not have un understood it correctly. We're saying that you can, that there's, uh, use Nancy Hendrickson's example, a $400,000 bucket of money to be spent. But why would we say we're gonna spend it? Because BES is going to reimburse us and I don't see where that shows up as income and there's, um, I referred to, for instance, the DEQ grant that was awarded for over a five-year period. And then it 
never was really clear where that showed up and the five years was extended to seven, but that was $160,000. So um, speaking to the possibility of future grants and the opportunities that are out there, how do we, because it seems like $400,000 is inflated due to past spending and I didn't hear any big expenditure beyond what we've spent in previous years this year. So I don't understand why the amount has increased so much and what the incentive is for MCD to find alternative funding like um, BES and Daryl Houtman and um, volunteer work that goes on in the Arboretum that sort of thing. I, I didn't see any reference to that, any offsetting um, opportunities, whether it be in kind or cash dollars, but. Um, but let me let me try and answer, Mary Helen. And um, okay. if somebody from finance wants to answer, I think the reason the number looks big to you is because it's a multi-year contract. And each year the board will have to approve a budget before we can access that contract but there's no commitment to spending the full amount in the contract, it gives us the ability to spend that within the approved budget of the board. So because this contract extends, I think for five years, I may not have that right. Yes. That we, we need that headroom. And the reason that we go for five years is because it's a lot of work to go through that competitive bidding process and to educate vendors and get them all up to speed. We also wanna balance that efficiency with fair competition and giving multiple people opportunities to bid for our work, which is what we've just done. And we have new vendors and we're issuing a new five-year contract, but in any given year, the board's gonna have to approve the budget to go forward. So you said new vendors, they're vendors that you've done business with for seven or eight years, but- One of them, one of them, yes. Yeah, yeah, one yes, one no is my understanding. But they had to reapply and, and go through a competitive process to get the continued business. Okay, but I don't see any incentive to obtain any extra funding. Um, and so maybe that's not part of a budget process. And so I don't know why it couldn't be $300,000 or $500,000. I didn't see any... Um, Again, I think we forecasted based on previous expenditures and the need to keep the vegetation under control. Um, it doesn't mean we're not gonna look for grants, but we do wanna make sure that we can manage the vegetation so we don't get flooding. Uh, I do think there's opportunities for us to pursue grants and those will continue. But because we need to be sure we have the capability, we need this contract in place. I hope I've answered your question. If not, I, well, I regret well, you started it and would it, love but to. I'm, I'm still not. I guess it's operational more than budget. I mean, that's, it seems like there was, give us the money and we'll spend it if we want. And we there's no incentive to not. So I, from my standpoint of protecting, I, I have to say this from protecting my dollars, have to know how best that can be spent. Can $100,000 of that money not be put in the budget therefore not be passed on to a resident, you know, to me. If my property tax, I, I, I got the um, sewer water bill. So let's just, I know it's urban district stuff, but if that money is put into a budget that then we have to come up with revenue for, that could impact the people that will be paying for that amount of money. And so if it's, it sounds overinflated to me. I, I don't have the figures that Eric has previous years, but it sounds overinflated to me and no um, incentive to seek other funds other than they always have before. And BES might not always do as they have done before. I think that Daryl Hobman told me they were contributing $73,000 to the overall um, maintenance, but I, I don't know if I remember that amount correctly. Um, so may I suggest, I think the appropriate place for the board to weigh in on that would be on the budget. And if you want us to not spend money on aquatic vegetation or these on-call contracts, the board would, would reduce the budget for that. And the budget would control the spending. The contract doesn't control the spending per se. Um, it puts a cap on the spending. 
and the amount we can spend without board approval. Okay, so Jim, I, I just we're behind. Wendy said so. I'll just leave it till we get to the budget part and. Okay, well, I regret, I regret not successfully answering your question and would look forward to no, trying it, to get it, an answer. It wasn't that successful. It was just confusing to me why other options weren't taken into account when you came up with a $400,000 amount. Maybe I can answer that question for you, Mary Helen. The way we account for these sorts of transactions is that the spending is on an expenditure line and the support that we receive for that spending is on a revenue line. So we don't, we don't net the two and put the difference on this expenditure line in the budget. So the revenue from BES is in the revenue section on the financial statements and the expenses down in the expense line. And, and Jim is right, this is a five-year contract. So when you look at the dollar amount, we're not going to spend that amount each year. That's in total over five years. So if you take that total divided by five, that would give you sort of a sense of the annual amount. But that, but those are going to be the revenue coming in is going to be on a different line. And I guess you're asking the incentive for getting those support payments. I mean, I think everyone here at the district is constantly looking for sources of funding. We know that um, we have challenges with funding and we know that we need to be responsible with our landowner dollars. And so I've, I, I, my sense is that folks are constantly looking for those sources of funding to be able to support the work we're doing. Um, so that's the incentive is that we all here do care about those things and we're working really hard to make sure that we get that funding. And thank you. Even, and even with outside oh, funding question. coming in, I might just add really quick with outside funding coming in, we would still need to have the tool and the mechanism to have the experts do the work. So even if in the future we do find additional grant money or different revenue sources, we still need to have this mechanism in place to be able to hire these people to do the work for us. Val, you had a question? You're muted, Val. I'm having trouble with my unmute here. Now, I want just want to encourage you to pursue uh, bringing that expertise in-house. It would seem to me that uh, uh, with uh, all our, our staff with eyes on the ditches and everything that uh, we can be handled more efficiently locally once you have the expertise and licensing and that sort of thing. So I would just encourage you to pursue that, uh, you know, acquire that as much as possible so you don't have to go to an outside contractor. That's all. So, uh, Jim, we'll take the rest of this conversation offline, but I think that we can agree that there are a couple of things that would be very helpful for the board. One is to do this make versus buy analysis that Val has identified. There are times in which hiring an outside contractor versus having somebody inside is much more effective to add that personnel. And that would be one of the options that Val in particular wants to explore. The second element is really just saying, you know, some of the accounting for this is complex and that um, the one line item on our budget for invasive species management doesn't include everything. And so getting to the point that we have the financial data of what we've spent and then can look at the delta, meaning the additional activities that we'll undertake, that would be important for us to understand why you're looking at uh, a $400,000 or $80,000 a month uh, per year um, kind of spending. Kathy, you had a question? Yeah, um, I honestly do not see a problem with this based upon the conversation that you've had thus far. About $80,000 a year sounds like it's on par with the estimates or the costs that have been incurred you're looking at what 20 to 22,000 each year plus 30,000 plus I heard 130k over 3 years that adds up to about 90,000 per year um yeah. so um 
all that aside, it would be helpful to have that information when it comes time to set the budget. Again, this is just a mechanism to ensure that the work can get done. The actual expenditures have to be uh, run approved by the board, so I'm not concerned about that. I also do not think that it's a good use of staff time to do an analysis at this point of bringing that work in-house versus contracting. There's a lot going on. <laughs> I feel like the best we can be doing is supporting the ongoing maintenance and operations while the PMLS project is getting uh, underway and the, the work to stand up the new district um, is getting done. So if that's something that kind of, um, you know, bringing the services in-house versus contracting out analysis is important, I would recommend looking at that for the new district. Okay, um, are we ready to vote on this? Looking for a couple of nods along the way. All right, so I'm looking for a um, a motion. Uh, it, does somebody want to propose that? I can do that. I move to approve and authorize the executive director or their designee to negotiate and sign a contract for the on-call natural resources and vegetation management services with the maximum contract value of $400,000 for PIN 2 over the course of five years. Do I hear a second? Val Humble okay. second. Val Humble is seconded. Is, is there any discussion? Yes, hearing none, um, we need a roll call vote on this. Wendy, if you would help us. Mary Helen Kincaid. I vote no until we get the additional information that's been requested about um, spending and um, allocation of the money. Um, I'm not willing to vote on $400,000 until I know the details that have been asked. Kathy Kellum. I vote aye. Bill Humble. Aye. Eric Molander. Also votes aye. So in that case, it, mo it passes. But I do want to uh, recognize that we are looking for some additional information, Amber, that so that we can better understand uh, the, the program. Okay, so the next item of business is for us to talk about the next phases of the PMLS. And Hong, I see that you're up for the cost sharing and IGA design agreements. Uh, I will be after Colin. Yeah, yeah, nice. Colin. Thanks, Hong. Um, hi, Colin Rohan, uh, Director of Planning Public Affairs, and just wanted to take a minute to um, introduce uh, a guest that we have here. Kendra Winston is the Army Corps of Engineers PMLS Project Manager, and so uh, she has been going to uh, the different board meetings that we've been having this week and next week um, and introducing herself. So uh, without laboring that, let me hand it over to Kendra to introduce herself. Good afternoon. As Colin said, I'm the project manager uh, from the Army Corps of Engineers here in Portland District. Uh, names, my name is Kendra Winston. I'm looking forward to working with everyone. I'm happy to take any questions, but otherwise just wanted to um, introduce myself today, say hello, um, and uh, again, look forward to starting our design process soon. Thanks, Kendra. And um, thank yeah, you very I much. And... Leave it to the so thank you very much, Kendra. We're looking forward to working with you as well. Um, Colin, anything else? Yeah, I just want to, um, so briefly, uh, a reminder of, of where we are. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers has a uh, Portland district uh, where Kendra is um, working from. They have received uh, funding coming down from headquarters uh, to begin working and collaborating with us as the non-federal sponsors. So all four of the districts are the non-federal sponsors. Um, and that funding is to collaborate um, on uh, working toward signing the design agreement. And so 
What Hong is going to walk through is the steps that we need to take uh, as the non-federal sponsors collectively to uh, financially and um, otherwise prepare ourselves um, via different resolutions to do that. Um, one thing uh, that be considering for today is that um, grant funding from Business Oregon. I think that is hugely important. Just a, a note that the Army Corps of Engineers for this next phase, three and a half years of the uh, pre-construction engineering design uh, will be paying, uh, will be covering 65% of that. And as the non-federal sponsors, we're responsible for 35% of that. Um, the Business Oregon grants will cover 80% of that 30%. And so that leaves 7% um, to the uh, non-federal sponsors to cover in cash. And so that's in your existing FY23 budget and your proposed FY24 budget. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when Lori presents the budget, um, what that looks like. But uh, yeah, the next steps are to consider the contract. So I should hand it over to Hong. All right. Thank you, Colin. So you have two uh, in your bo uh, board packet material, you have two memos for me. This is the first of the, the two. And it's one that will require action from the board to approve. It's a proposed resolution 2023-0501 for you to uh, authorize, uh, approve and authorize for, for, for signing uh, the Oregon Business Grant. It is a grant that uh, will mark you receiving money from the state uh, to support the 80% of the 30%. So uh, it is the first step in the PMLS uh, design project. Uh, as you may recall, all of the legacy boards passed in February, 2022, uh, a resolution to agree to contribute to the, the non-federal sponsor share of the PMLS uh, project in this particular case, the pre-engineering and design phase, we'll call it the design phase. Um, and in that resolution that you agreed to back in February 2022, uh, you would uh, agree to doing that if you receive the state grant uh, uh, funds. And so this contract is that state grant that's coming in. Um, the grant is executed at uh, is being offered in, uh, to each individual legacy district to sign. Um, we've worked with the state pursuant to uh, SDIC's council. Uh, we received additional language that clarify that if the PED phase and the um, contribution for it goes beyond a period in which there is dissolution of the legacy districts that the granting rights under this grant agreement will transfer to the urban district. So if the legacy districts pen to goes away, the money will then move up to the urban district should we need to be able, uh, should we need to be in that time frame in the future. So that's a good thing. Um, the action today is to approve uh, this grant agreement. Once it's been signed, it triggers the next set of steps to uh, fully go into the PED phase. And that's the topic of my second memo. And I can get into the details of that a little bit more um, after we take up this resolution. But those steps include assigning the JCA to act on behalf of the legacy districts as the local sponsor and to sign the design agreement, uh, to enter into a cost sharing agreement among the legacy districts to just uh, make sure that the money is going to the right uh, right uh, channel through the JCA to pay the core for its uh, for uh, to pay the core for the non-federal sponsor share, and then for the JCA to execute the design. So that that again, those last three steps that I've enumerated is in my second half of the presentation. And before we get into those three steps, I'll just stop right here and ask if there are questions with the first step, which is uh, approval of the Oregon grant. Uh, agreement in which we are receiving money from Oregon to help the legacy districts pay for the PED local contribution share. Okay, so uh, and, and again, uh, what we're faced with here is um, to sign an agreement to allow us to accept money from Business Oregon that then goes into the design and engineering. I'm looking at um, my board members. Do we 
Are there any questions that you'd like to raise on this? Just, just a note that the uh, example in the uh, packet had my name on it rather than yours, but that's that'll be corrected. Thank you, Val. Okay, thank you, Val, for that. Um, if there are no other questions about this, um, I need somebody to uh, make a motion to approve. I'd, I'd be glad to do that. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I move to adopt resolution 2023-05-01, approving a financing contract with the Oregon Business Development Department for certain levy grant funds applicable to the PED phase of the PMLS project. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay, is there any further discussion on this? Uh, in which case, uh, Wendy will need a roll call vote. Mary Helen Kincaid. Aye. Kathy Kellen. Aye. Val Humble. Aye. Eric Molander. Aye. Uh, that resolution passes. And now, Hong, I think that you're still at the dais. And, I am. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, may I just call out Colin Roanne and his team for the work to get the revenue from the state? It's really been phenomenal and really helped us through the cost allocation issues. So I just want to acknowledge the work. And obviously, legal had a ton of work to do with it, finance. But um, thanks to the team for finding a lot of money that we now don't have to charge our landowners. So thank you, Colin. Thank you, team. Okay. I neglected to say thank you as well. Since I'm the one that's always saying, don't and don't spend our money. So thank you for <laughs> finding the money, so we don't have to charge people. Okay. Well, the money you've accepted comes with some strings, which is uh, what I'm about to talk. Uh, if you have your packet in front of you, it's on starts on page 21, which is my second memo, and it lays out the steps and the uh, uh, proposed resolutions and agreements that will be coming back to this board in June uh, to, to ask for your uh, execution and approval. So we're providing it a, a month in advance. Um, following the acceptance of the, uh, the, the money from the Oregon State, uh, Oregon State, you'll be like we did with other uh, uh, core uh, federal funding projects uh, will be asking the legacy districts to assign to the JCA, which was an, a joint contracting authority that we created solely for these types of projects where there are mutual benefits across the, uh, the four districts to serve as the contracting authority. And the reason why uh, I'm making you go through all of this is because I have to sign a legal um, authorization certification at the end of this. And, and these are things that uh, provide the, the assurances for me that we have authority and for you that you have authority uh, for me to, to sign. So with that, uh, the first one will be having all uh, legacy districts pass a resolution that will assign uh, that authority to the JCA to act on its behalf as the contracting authority. Um, and, and that's because the legacy districts are the ones that have the O&M operation and maintenance responsibility for the infrastructure to which we are redesigning and improving upon. Uh, the next, uh, after that, we'll be asking uh, again, all of the parties to enter into an IGA uh, to, uh, to confirm and commit your uh, to confirm your commitment to the uh, your share of the local uh, local uh, the contribution to the non-federal sponsor share the the uh, twenty percent of the thirty percent of the eighty percent uh, the <laughs> it it will it will document your your promise to pay from your uh, assessment funds. Oh gosh, 80, the the 3% that's left. No, the 8% that's left. We got 7%, but yeah. 7% that's left. Uh, and, and that is uh, laid out in exhibit A of that IGA. And each district is uh, equally is expected to contribute 1,000 and one, uh, 101,630 
uh, thirty-five thousand dollars for fiscal year 2022 and 2023, and eighty thousand seven hundred. Uh, uh, dollars for the next year, uh, 40,000 or so for the following year. And we hope that by the fourth year, we'll be in a position to have dissolved the districts and that the fundings will go. The remaining last year will be the responsibility of the urban district, but that remains to be seen. So uh, with that, we'll be expecting the JCA to also be a party to this IGA. So they'll be the one that's going to be accepting the responsibility to administer uh, the funding and, and the payment to the core as required by the funding agreement. Uh, the last one will be just heading to the JCA itself to sign a resolution to accept the assignment and perform, uh, perform under the cost sharing agreement as they are instructed to do from the legacy board. Each of the legacy board has a member on the JCA. And so I believe on this board, it's Karen, but I could be wrong. Uh, and so she will be the one that will be the voice for this board on that on that um, uh, authority, on that contracting authority board. Again, uh, we'll be back to you in May, in June to uh, ask for author uh, authority here. I, I will just note that we have presented uh, the proposal of the cost sharing IGA to both SDIC and MCDD. SDIC has proposed some, some uh, suggested some edits to clarify uh, the commitment that we're making with uh, the, the core to confirm that um, uh, we'll be, uh, we'll try not to delay payments. I, I believe that is the language, but I'm asking, I'll be working with Brian Sheets to come up with language that is appropriate for uh, from his perspective, and we'll share that with the board. It's it's a minor, I think it's a minor, a, a good minor edit. Um, I don't think it's a deal breaker. It's not going to be substantially significant that would alter the, the course of, of where we're going. But I will get that out to the board as soon as I have it, and we'll be expecting you all to take a look at it. And I, my goal is to be able to have the same uh, 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 all boards accept the same language and not have to have different language for different boards. So with that, I will open it up for questions. Kathy? Um, I had a question about sort of the sequencing of um, money go coming in and going out because it got a little confusing across the, the different entities. So the um, the state money is reimbursement only, right? It's it's not reimbursement. It it will be a disbursement. So it would be a, we'll get a funding request letter from the core, um, and we'll then send in a disbursement request. What we do have to show, and, and it's just through your annual um, adopted budget, over to um, Business Oregon. You need to have that basically the 20%, uh, your kind of fiscal contribution needs to be shown and that will need to go to the core. Okay, so there's not going to be a point in which the districts are fronting a huge chunk of change and then waiting for compensation from the state, for example. That, that's correct. None of, okay. the, none of the boards are in a position to do that. Right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> when I read through it, it, it just looked a little bit odd because of the, the core doing the annual funding request letter. And, but then you can, you need to go to the state um, on a rolling basis. And so um, it sounds like the core and the state have done this before and there aren't going to be surprises. Uh, that, that's the hope. We, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 just to that point, Kathy, uh, you and Brian Sheets maybe think alike. Uh, his his request for modification to the IGA language is to clarify that uh, clarify that kind of situation. Okay, great. And I would like to take the opportunity to thank Kendra since she is on here. Um, we've been working with Business Oregon and their uh, regional development officers to um, come up with a way to sort of fast track that request. Um, and so that we better meet the turnaround time. And Kendra was able to at least provide a draft for their review of what that um, like uh, early funding request letter would look like so that we can actually send in the disbursement once we 
sign the contracts and do all the rest of the work. Um, so that they can do everything on their end before the official letter starts and then the clock can start. So it will it will accelerate things. Um, and so that's not to guarantee that there won't be any hitches, hiccups, um, but I think we've done a lot of work to try to make it as smooth as possible. Okay, and it's a 90 day window once the CORE's funding request letter is sent? 60 so, days uh, 60 for days. the first fiscal year and 30 days uh, for the second fiscal year. And so that's why that sort of quick turnaround time is so important. And um, also to, um, you know, sort of our financial capabilities, uh, a testament that, we, you know, we, we need to attest to the core that we're able to meet those things. And so that's what um, Business Oregon is aware of and working with us to be able to expedite those things. Okay. Well, if uh, Business Oregon feels confident they can turn it around <laughs> in that time frame, then I'll, I'll hope for the best. Okay. Um, other questions about the nature of this agreement? So Hong, as I understand it, the these next two you'll bring to us in June, but it's basically uh, for administrative purposes so that such that the core has one party to deal with for uh, payments and reimbursements, et cetera. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. And then uh, it's also our obligation, since we just signed the agreement with Business Oregon, to fund the JCA for that. Um, a question that has come up in uh, meetings with neighborhood associations and groups here has been, who actually approves the final design uh, for the PMLS project within Pen2? I can uh, take a first crack at that, but we do have Kendra here, and so ultimately, this is a federal, this is a federally authorized levy system, and so it is uh, the design by the Army Corps of Engineers, who is responsible for that design, um, designing it to the design uh, water surface elevations um, that meet all of those federal requirements. Um, and so that final design is uh, the Army Corps design. However, uh, for Penn 2 and the three other districts, um, we and Bill Owen as chief engineer need to sign off on the operability of that design. And so we do need, we, as the Corps comes in, um, we support them, partner with them in making those investments. After the investments, then they turn over in perpetuity the um, operation of that system, and we need to keep it to that federal design. We need to be able to test that we're able to operate the system and be able to keep it up to that uh, federal um, level. And so that sort of operability sign off is uh, part of our partnership um, agreements that we have uh, with the core that will be in the design and construction. And uh, Kendra, if you're able to if, uh, correct anything I may have gone wrong or add anything additional, that would be great. I, I think you summarized that really well, Colin. Um, as he said, that that is correct. This is a, a federal design project um, and a, a federal construction project. However, um, this is a, a, a piece of work that we'll, we will do together and ensure that the, the project functions, that it is constructible, uh, and that it, as Colin pointed out, operable. Um, and so that will be part of the design process, even though its, it's, its origin is with, with the federal um, Army Corps. Right. And, and so when we look at this, particularly for the part of the project that goes down Bridgeton Road and across Marine Drive, you'll be raising Marine Drive in some instances up to 42 inches. Um, and that will greatly impact the neighbors. Uh, at what point is uh, their input requested and uh, how does that affect our operability of the levy? Yeah, we'll, we will be working through the, the kind of planning of the detailed design here in the next few months. Um, we're at the stage, uh, as we've just discussed, uh, of establishing the design agreement. And so this will be an ongoing effort. Um, we will be working with the districts collectively to, to manage what that stakeholder and local resident input needs to be. And then primarily that, that um, coordination is with the non-federal sponsor. So 
it is my intention and, you know, the core's full intention to be supportive of that and integrate that into our schedule, but we'll really look to you all to make sure that that necessary input um, comes into the project. And that follows so Colin, with what is we that had, be the... Oh, please, go. sorry, go ahead, Eric. Colin, is, is that going to be the responsibility of the JCA or the Pen2 board? It, that is the responsibility of the non-federal sponsors collectively. So it's not, and this is similar to in the feasibility uh, phase. And so, you know, the, all of the sort of, you know, using the format as your convening table, um, that is where uh, all four districts are the non-federal sponsor, um, at least in the feasibility phase, the JCA um, representatives, it's really, focused on the contracting elements of it. But as far as the policy making, being responsive to your uh, neighborhood needs, that should remain at the format table. Um, and so that's what we did in the feasibility phase where there were um, you know, specific outreach to property owners, there were neighborhood walks, there were um, community meetings, and we'll continue to use that as well as um, the Levy Ready Columbia partnership um, it, this is a project that has been a focus of that partnership. So leveraging that table that includes uh, the cities, county, metro, Port of Portland, and, and others um, to have that sort of broader uh, voice is really important. But um, the, during our last meeting, similar questions were asked um, about sort of the more immediate piece, which is um, really registering what those specific uh, neighborhood concerns are. And so we have uh, a plan once we're underway um, in this design phase to actually do that outreach, um, working with Kearns and West um, to do surveys, uh, to also do individual interviews basically with um, uh, residential and commercial property owners um, to identify any of the specific needs they have, everything from landscaping to access needs so that we can have a really strong registry of all those things will also be, and, and as us as the non-federal sponsors, we're gonna be responsible for hosting things like neighborhood walks or um, uh, informational meetings and things like that. And I think the core uh, in general is pretty happy to, to be there and to answer questions, but we're gonna be the one convening. So specifically then you, you won't come back to us as a board to seek our approval of the final design. Yeah, the, the board's role is really to direct on the, the policy of, of this work overall, but as far as the design, it is an engineering effort, right? And so it is a federal project. Um, and so it's been identified what the, um, you know, the, the recommended alternative has been identified and sort of what the design options are. Um, was really in the feasibility phase, moving into the design phases to refine those and, and to sort of figure out how to implement them. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for either Colin or Kendra or Hong? So we have about a month to review this as well, and we will expect this to be on the agenda for uh, the June meeting. Kendra, thank you so much for attending. Thank you as well. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is going to be our CIP plan. Yeah, good afternoon, all. Bill Owen, Director of Engineering and Operations, Chief Engineer. Um, I'm fighting, fighting a little bit of a cold, so hopefully the day quill will keep me going uh, for the for the meeting here. Um, I don't have a lot of time, so um, the proposed CIP package is in your document, in your materials. It starts on page uh, 42, that's the cover uh, memo, but the actual report itself um, starts on page 43. I'm gonna walk through this pretty quickly so we have some time um, and potentially still um, you know, get 10, 15 minutes left for Lori to finish up the, um, the budget. So I'm gonna share my screen so uh, we can walk through this together. Let me know when you can, you can see this. Thumbs up. Okay, so 
Uh, for those who have seen uh, the CIP uh, package and pass, it looks this version looks very similar. Um, it starts off, uh, it's a five year CIP. Um, it starts off with a very brief executive summary indicating uh, what the totals are for the five year um, period, which is just uh, under um, what $15 million in this case, and the amount of investments for next fiscal year, which is about $1.5 million. There's a section about uh, a background of what the district does and what the purpose of the CIP is. Um, then there's uh, an overview of the development of this plan uh, and it goes through four steps, including identification of projects, scoring those projects based on criteria and weights that the board has approved and passed. Those criteria and weights have not changed. Um, and then uh, continuing uh, an evaluation of each project by applying additional value added criteria that's listed in this uh, section, um, ranging from community benefits, equity, um, workplace environmental benefit, and so forth that you can read here. And finally, um, step four is to rank those projects based on information from steps one, two, and three. Um, those projects that uh, have an immediate regulatory compliance issue or have a partner financial support component get elevated to the top of the priority list um, and, uh, and, and thus uh, adjusted uh, and, and recognized during the schedule uh, as, as allowed. Last year, I added a section about cost estimates um, just to help um, your board and other boards understand um, that there is variability in uh, accuracy of project costs, depending on the maturity level of that of those projects. So I include the same table as last year. So for instance, if a project starts at a, um, just at the master plan level, for instance, your drainage master plan was finished not too long ago, um, that um, represents a good stab at what the, the problem exists for that particular um, issue uh, and a proposed design solution. But because there is very limited time to walk through the, uh, the process to uh, go into detail about that design, the cost accuracy is very broad. Uh, and that's what is noted here in the final in the far right column. Um, the, the estimate typically can you know, um, range anywhere from minus 50 to plus 100 percent of the, the cost that's proposed or is derived um, based on parametric um, information. So uh, it's a good starting point, though, um, and my intent is, and, and sorry, and as, you, as you, the project moves, continues forward, um, all the way up to um, get to um, uh, construction bids, um, the cost estimate, then of course, uh, accuracy narrows um, down to you know, minus 10 or plus 15 or plus or minus 5%, depending on the situation. Um, I, I noted to the board last year, and I'll repeat this year, that a lot of the projects that are listed in the CIP originate from the drainage master plan. Um, so they have good, um, they have a, a foundational basis to them and a based on a stamped report that an engineer has completed, but they're just at the very beginning stages of uh, understanding what that solution is. As this board well knows, things can change during pre-design. Um, and so what my intent to do is in moving forward is that we um, develop um, approvals for pre-design phases, uh, which could be, you know, could be 100, 150,000 or so or less, depending on the complexity of the project. And then once pre-design is done, we're getting close to 30%, circle back with the board and say, look, now we've really had a chance to dig into this project, understand what the complexities are. Maybe there's a big hole in the bottom of the slough, for instance. And now we realize that you know, what we thought was a $5,000 project is not $5,000 anymore. Um, and so the board has a better understanding of what the construction costs and final design phase would be in order to finish that project uh, as proposed. Uh, we've had situations in past where um, that has happened uh, and 
Uh, and, and this board is elected to move forward and in the MCD board, for instance, we got to 30% design and the board elected not to move forward with the construction project because the value added to the board and to the district didn't, didn't justify the cost to it, at least at that point. So it's it's going to be a, a good um, gateway uh, for this board to have another touch point on uh, projects moving forward. And so these estimated cl um, class categories are listed in Appendix A with the rest of the details of the budget. The last phase of the of the uh, the CIP uh, is highlights the five year plan. It outlines uh, some numbers, how it differ, what the what the differences are. Um, for instance, this year, this and this next year, uh, we'll continue working on the Northeast Thirteenth Avenue pump station project, on the SCADA project, um, as well as the PMLS work that you already talked about today. Um, and then it continues by expo by explaining what the differences are from the last year's five year outlook versus what's proposed this year. And so that's what these bullet points represent. Uh, in some cases, the, the project continues like the fall safety project, um, and, but it just doesn't show up in the CIP anymore. It's, it's on private property uh, and our interpretation of uh, uh, budget standards, it just, that information just falls in a different part of the budget. So you don't see that uh, in the CIP. Um, and then you can read um, about uh, the other things that are going on for next year. There is a section in here at the end that comments on what staff's assumptions are for an um, escalation over time, because we need to recognize costs go up each year. In this case, after some research from uh, with other um, uh, online sources, federal governments and, and other and industry indices, um, a and B, some conversations with our peers and other similar agencies. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we elected to apply a 7% annual escalation for next year alone, and then step it down one percentage point each year thereafter, back down to something that's closer to a long-term average, which is um, which is approximately 4%. So 7% uh, next year, year two, 2%, year three, sorry, year two, 6%, uh, year three, 5%, and then years four through 10 is 4%. Um, the CIP document continues uh, with two appendices. One is uh, this really large uh, spreadsheet. Hopefully you can see that in your own screen. I'm not sure if the, the numbers are very small on, on my version. Um, and then in Appendix B is a description of each project that's included in the five-year outlook. There is a section in the this document that talks about years six through 10, just to give you all an, an, uh, what, an idea of what's coming up in, in the longer term period. Those um, projects that are funded through six through 10 are not included in detail in Appendix B. So that's an overview of the CIP. Um, and let me stop there um, to answer any questions and, and with some hope that uh, there's some time left for the, uh, the budget update. So um, or do you have any questions associated with this? No, I think that we're all good on this um, with that as background are you looking for a specific motion from the board at this point bill or you know um it's, it's almost like i prepped you for this uh but no it is, i do not what i'm intending to do is to give you information um that so you're not surprised by what um you actually do vote on next month during the june format meeting which is the final cip um, and I'll make sure to provide that document uh, ahead of time so you have and, and any explanation of what's changed um, between now and then. Got it. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much for that. And Bill, are you looking for us to do a form of policy that sets a, um, a milestone at 30% that we fund to and then look for a formal vote on the total authorized? 
Yeah, it's an interesting thought, Eric. Um, I am not today. I, I haven't considered that approach. Uh, that uh, yeah, that approach. But um, it's some, if the board is interested in in going down that road, um, I'm I'm open to that. Certainly, um, I just wanted to make sure to let you know that um, because uh, that that's my intent to do. Because right. I know there's some. Um, there's some consternation and, and honestly some frustration by right, when the project changes uh, after at 30 percent and the costs end up being different than what you all voted on early on. So I, I was expressing more about what my my thought process is, but if the board wants to do something that's more formal, I'm open to that approach. Okay, and excellent. So um, potentially an item for future discussion in terms of board policy. Excellent. All right. So with that, I think that we're, were there any questions about individual projects on the CIP list? Um, and if not, let's move on to the next item on our budget, which is the um, 2324 budget. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. And I'm just going to jump right past this piece. So in your packet today, you have an updated proposed budget for 2324. There were just a couple of changes that got run through after our discussion the last time we presented the budget. And I will walk you through those quickly today. So in, as we discussed earlier, um, the PMLS project Year one funding has moved from the current fiscal year to fiscal year 23-24. So in other revenues, the grant funding for the local match for the project has shifted. Um, so we have two years worth of funding instead of one in 23-24. So we have the year one and year two funding, um, which is those grant funds being shown in the 23-24 budget. Additionally, um, there have been some timing adjustments that we'll talk about with other projects. I'm going to move on down. So in capital, there are three different changes that have been made to the proposed budget here. The 13th Avenue grant funds have been adjusted to reflect project schedule. So we've had some shifting in the project schedule and that has changed grant funds in other revenues above, as well as the spending on the project in capital. We have the Schmier Road electrical upgrades have been delayed to a future year. So those have been removed from the 23-24 budget. And then we've got that shift in the timing of the local match payment for the PMLS. So there are two years worth of local match payments showing up in 23-24. So if we move then to the list of capital projects, this number will tie out to what you saw um, presented by Bill previously on the CIP. We've got three projects that are included for 23-24, the 13th Avenue pump station discharge pipes. That dollar amount has changed to reflect the timing of the project. So there's $615,000 there, the SCADA system upgrade, and then two years of the PMLS local match funding gives you the, the total of almost $1.6 million in capital spending for 23-24. And that is the end of the changes. With that, I'm going to stop sharing. And if you have any questions, I can attempt to answer those at this point. I have a question. I don't know if this is the place to ask it, but on in reviewing with the flood safety district, there was a um, budget proposal of possible revenue from the four districts for community engagement that totaled 100,000, 40,000 yes. of it was from Pen 2. Correct. Where does that reflect it in the proposed budget that's in our packet? Let me, and, it is in your packet in the proposed budget and I'm just pulling it up so I can give you the specific line item. Okay. It is included. And just for some entertainment, I just got a text message with a picture of Karen Myers, who's in Paris at her 
granddaughter's graduation. So um, she said, hope you all are having fun, but I'm having more. So. <laughs> so that's included in contracts and agreements. So that total proposed budget for that line item is $335,938. Um, which includes the JCA payment of 76,000, the urban payment of 40,000, and the MCDD administration fixed charge of 219, almost $220,000. So okay. if you pull open your revised proposed budget that's included in your board packet, and I don't know what page that's on, um, there is a detailed schedule that shows you all of those line items and in contracts and agreements, which is an expenditure that $40,000 um, is included there. Okay, I'm not finding it, but that's not, is that something that we need to, will be approved as part of any action today or? No, I'm not asking for any action today, Mary Helen. I'm just giving you an update on the changes that have been made to the proposed budget. Um, the board will be considering approval and authorization of the budget at the format meeting in June. Okay. Tell me again what heading, I'm sorry. I've... Contracts and agreements. Okay. So let me pull up so my screen just to show you. For, uh, this, is what the, this is what the schedule looks like. Let me make this a little bit bigger. So the schedule looks like this in your budget document. And here's total contracts and agreements, 335,000, almost $336,000. The 40,000 is included in that line item for the budget. Okay, so it's not singled out, it's just in the total. Well, it's singled out right here, where it says Urban Flood Safety Water Quality District, $40,000. Okay, I'll have to keep looking because I don't see that online. This this schedule is I can help you with that later time. on, Mary. Yeah, okay, no, that's all right. Okay. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. All right. So I do have a question for you on, and Bill Owen, I think is going to be the, the person that can best answer it. I read through the description of the SLU um, levy riverward modernization. Bill, what's the actual activity that's going to go on there? Yeah, let me take a stab at that if I could. Uh, so this is a project it's a basically a pre-design phase as i was uh, explaining earlier but this is a project that recognizes that, that there is a opportunity to make some improvements to the columbia slough levy um just i guess i guess it'd be just east of i-5 um east of, just east of denver avenue so it may be closer to on the Schmier Road pump station. And the idea here is that um, we have, there are a couple of issues here. One, we don't, we have very poor access to the riverward side of the levee as opposed to the landward side. So um, we, with our arm mowers, we can get down a fair ways and, and, and mow for a little bit, but it only gets you so far. It's because of the, the slope is so steep. So what we'd like to do is uh, start, uh, to explore what it would take to expand the um, the levee on the riverward side, widen it, and so we can get down and create like a maintenance bench, for instance, so we can get much oh, further down into onto the riverward side of the levee. And in doing so, there are other th considerations that we want to do to help um, reduce seepage, possibly uh, look at. Um, some environmental benefits at the very toe of the levee uh, if it's um, if, the, if we're adding more material out there. So there's those type of considerations and that mix of uh, maintenance improvements and environmental benefits is the modernization word as part of that project. So hopefully that uh, answers your question. So when we talk about that maintenance bench, um, to me that seems a lot like on the Columbia Riverside at I-205, there is the levee and then uh, on the overbuild, there's another flat area that is, is that what we're talking about? Yep, excellent example. That's exactly what we're thinking. It won't be as wide as the, uh, the Marine Drive uh, levee, 
Um, it has a lot, quite a bit of overbuild. Uh, but at the very least, we can get a tractor or you know pickup down to with a two track down to a place maybe halfway down the levee. Uh, and to be able to access there from the land side, as opposed to just putting our, um, getting to that point just through our jet boat onto the, on the water side. Got it. And so this is really just for engineering and design at this point. It's not the actual construction of that maintenance bench, correct? Correct. Um, the, and the intent here, again, is get to 30% design and then decide what we want to do. When you so east of Denver Avenue. Yeah, that's for the most part. That's, I'm sorry, that's almost the entire stretch of of uh, Pen Two Levy, so that doesn't help you very much. Um, but I I think the targeted area is between uh, um, uh, Denver Avenue and I five. So there's that stretch where we actually have some relief wells out there now, but we're not as confident those relief wells are operating as. Um, as uh, efficiently as we would right. like, so. Okay, excellent. Thank you for that explanation. Um, are there other questions from the board members that we have? So question for you, Lori, as we look at all these changes, we've got a lot of moving pieces and parts uh, with money moving out of this year into next. Um, mm -hmm. And when we think about some of the uh, favorable impacts, we see that um, overall, um, we're having about 300,000 less in total um, capital spending. Um, and we're favorable about 345,000 from the prior budget that you had presented. Um, and we're, we're looking for our beginning balance uh, to be favorable 100,000. Are, are you still comfortable that we're gonna end up at that level? Yes. There, there hasn't been any shift in our projections for the current year. That $100,000 is basically the shift of our piece of the local match funding that was um, originally anticipated to occur in 22-23. It's 101635 is the exact amount. And so that's uh, the piece that shifted into the beginning fund balance. And then that gets spent um, in the budget for 23-24. Got it. And as you said earlier, through the month of March, we were 800,000 favorable to plan in terms of our total. But right, but it's expect... total budget to nine months right. worth of actual. So it's kind of um, a little bit funky when you look at it. Right, right. Got it. All right. Uh, since there's no action required on that uh, today, Let's move on to the next one. Thank you. Which is um, if Angel is here and would like to report out on any of the schedules that he's added to our budget package. Eric, I just want to note the time. It's 2.30. And... Right. I'm just giving, you know, he's added. Right. Uh, Angel has done considerable work to add in the uh, finance reports and just wanted to see if he needed to say anything to the board in that regard. At this moment, I do not have anything to add beyond what is being reported there. Thank you for the opportunity. Right. And thank you for the report. You're very welcome. Now you have a... I, I would just like to make uh, clear that... Uh, it is my hope and intention to resign from the board as soon as the board is prepared to fill my position. I don't want to put the board in a, in a position of having difficulty making quorum. So I'll stay on the board until you're ready to do it. But have, if any of you have, have a good candidate, uh, let's put that on the schedule maybe for the next meeting. Well, I think that that's going to be an important element. So one of the things I've done that uh, I'd hope to get to today 
which is the board's priorities for this coming year. And Kathy, thank you so much for adding your thoughts to that list. Uh, and I think that we're, we're beginning to get a real focus around uh, our commitment to engaging our communities, our commitment to making certain that we can actually have quorum uh, in October. Um, and there's this uh, entire set, uh, thought around succession planning that is unrelated to the hit TV show, but is really saying we need to do our best to start to have uh, a way to get people that are far younger than me uh, involved in this and uh, take the same level of interest. So uh, as we look forward to the next uh, time that we meet together only as a board, I think a more in-depth discussion of how all that plays out is going to be important and how we're going to reflect that in the future into the following year's budgets. So I'm gonna thank you for that. Um, do I have, um, Jim, any final words or thought? No, thank you for your participation today. I thought there was a lot of really good discussion and uh, appreciated the questions. And we have a few follow-up items that we're tracking. And thank you for uh, leading us through this today, Mr. Chair. Excellent. Uh, do I hear a motion for adjournment? I so move. Second. Do I hear a second? I did. I said second. Oh, good. <laughs> second, third, whatever. Uh, I also so want to thank the Wendy. meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much. Okay. And, and thank you, Wendy. I look for forward to seeing you at the format meeting. Okay. Thank you, guys. And thank you, Wendy, for printing the packet. It really helped me today. Great. I'm glad that helped. Thank you all. Have a good day.